Hello and welcome to this webinar on daguerreotypes, ambrotypes and tintypes. I've grouped these processes together because an archivist, curator, librarian or someone with some family things may well acquire a collection of 19th and 20th century photographs which include these processes. And the items you see here are typical of what it might contain. The first reaction when you get a collection like this is probably to start thinking in boxes, as I've shown here, where you've divided the collection up into prints, negatives, slides and others, and the others will usually include daguerreotypes, ambrotypes and tintypes. Dealing with prints is sort of comforting because they look familiar and are usually what is addressed first, be it for cataloguing or storage. Negatives and slides might be next, but if you're not used to dealing with a photographic collection, this final group in the bottom right corner might make you feel a bit more out of your comfort zone in terms of identification, care and making a digitised image. And yet they have so much to offer us as we shall see. These processes do share some things in common. They're all direct positives, which means that they have no intermediate negative stage, and so everyone's unique. And there's also another sort of logic in putting them together, and that is the space that they occupy within society. These photographs were usually portraits, particularly in Britain, and looking at it from a very British perspective, we could make a generalisation that the daguerreotype was used for the upper and upper middle classes, the ambrotype was used for the middle classes and the tintype was used for the working or occasionally middle classes. So as I said in my previous webinar, the process can tell you something about the sitter. The daguerreotypes and ambrotypes were usually taken and processed at a studio, whereas tintypes could be made at a fixed studio or a more portable arrangement set up in a park or at the seaside, for example. In all these cases, the portraits were usually taken to mark an event or something of significance. Therefore, these three processes were very important in documenting the social history in the 19th century and extending into the early 20th century in the case of the tin type. I should add that all these processes have been revived and adapted in recent years by enthusiasts, artists and photographers. Let's start by considering the daguerreotype. Louis-Jacques Mondet Daguerre saw the daguerreotype as a replacement for the miniature painting, and this chimes well with the fact that each is a unique direct positive. The daguerreotype process was announced in 1839 in France and was used until around the mid-1850s, and the situation over the patents influenced the availability of the process. The French government provided a lifelong pension to Daguerre and the process was made freely available except in England, Wales and bizarrely Berwick-on-Tweed uh, where it was all patented. In Scotland the situation was different and patents do not seem to have been widely enforced. However, the cost of the process and the size of the population was obviously a natural limit on the numbers made. So how is a daguerreotype made? Essentially you start with a copper plate which is coated on one side with a layer of polished silver. In the early ones the layers were effectively pressed together but most were electroplated. The plate is made light sensitive by exposing it to iodine vapours. Later bromine and chlorine were added, this made the plate more sensitive. It was exposed in a camera, this could be for up to minutes developed in mercury fumes, which formed silver mercury amalgam in the dark areas, and then fixed to remove unexposed silver halide, and the daguerreotypes were often hand-coloured. Obviously, when you think about it, if you were had to be stationary for up to minutes, um, you would also be clamped, usually, in position. You can imagine why the Victorians did not look particularly friendly in the photographs that were made at that time. Daguerreotypes are typically identified by altering the angle of view. Areas of silver mercury amalgam scatter the light relative to the smooth silver areas and suffice to say that this means that if you view the plate from the side in a raking light 
you will see a negative instead of a positive. Here you see an example of a fairly typical, simple early case, which is what you might expect from the 1840s. This is the inside of that case, again, fairly simple. And then some photographic studios began to introduce a gold stamp on the case. And then this is typical of the 1850s style of case, covered with Morocco leather and with a relief decoration. The alternative way that daguerreotypes were presented was framed in a passepartout, which sits as a distinct package in the frame. This frame isn't typical, but the passepartout in the format is, and you'll see a more typical frame in a minute. Here you can see how the passepartout is constructed, with a layer of dark paper next to the photograph, and then you can see a wide gold-coloured bevelled edge. That's actually a hollow strip of moulded card, painted with a bronze powder paint, and tipped onto a window mount of straw or millboard, which is out of sight. And above that, you have the painted decoration on the cover glass. This shows another passbar too, and it's the back of the mounts again, and uh, you can see from the back that they look quite crude. There may be some information on the back of the photograph, but often there isn't, and it's unusual to get a photographer's label on the back of the passepartout. The photographer would have inserted the photograph from the back of the passepartout by cutting a window in the board on the back and attaching the photograph, usually with paper strips, but but possibly with a whole variety of material, including wallpaper, newspaper and so on. Here is an example where the mount and the glass have been lifted away, and normally as a conservator you would access passepartout from the back, but it depends on the problem and the state of the paper around the edges. Daguerreotype plates are tricky in that at no point when working with them can you put them face down on a surface, or allow them to move against the surface as the photograph may be scratched, so often quite a bit of planning is involved. This is an example of a more typical frame which is dark and quite ornate. Photographers bought cases and passepartout off the shelf from photographic suppliers who advertised in the photographic journals as you can see here. There are some important things to know about daguerreotypes. As I've said, they're very susceptible to scratches and that's why they were presented behind glass and you'll almost never come across a loose plate because the image will have been destroyed. The other form of damage to the plate is tarnish, which typically occurs around the edges and this can often be exacerbated by gaseous contaminants in the atmosphere and will be made worse by a passport to or case which is split or damaged. In most cases, there is little that can be done safely to remove the tarnish. However, it's important that the cases or passepartout are repaired to prevent further damage. I make no apologies for saying it is important that this is done by a professional conservator, as it can be an intricate and complex task, even if it's not a lengthy job. Glass deterioration can often be found, and addressing that will also be part of the process. And you can see glass deterioration here as white flecks under the cover glass, particularly if you look at the background area. Glass deterioration has the potential to cause considerable damage if left untreated, as the metal mounts are thin, so the distance between glass and photograph is small, and if the deterioration makes contact with the surface, turquoise copper compounds are formed. I should also add that the velvet lining of cases and the leather covering of cases are also susceptible to insect damage. Now I know everyone needs their small conservation fix, which is partly why I included this one. So you can see that apart from the glass deterioration, there is also pressure sensitive tape at the bottom here. And if we look at the back of the preserver, you can see the copper back of the daguerreotype plate, and you can see that there's pressure sensitive tape at the top and the bottom. This is the daguerreotype plate taken out of the preserver, and you can see there's a hallmark in the top right corner as well. Most of them don't actually have hallmarks, but you do see them occasionally. 
And this is the package reassembled without the tape and after the cleaning of the glass to remove the glass deterioration. So that's the finished result. Now I want to talk next about the amber types and you might think this is a typical amber type. Strictly speaking it's not, it's actually a wet collodion positive on glass. And the amber type is one variation of a wet collodion positive which you virtually never see but bizarrely the name has stuck. So what is a wet collodion positive? A wet collodion positive is in essence a wet collodion negative with a black backing which makes it appear as a positive. The negative process was invented by Frederick Scott Archer in 1851 and it was introduced as a positive in 1852. And a wet collodion positive in this instance, as I say, is on glass and the emulsion is usually, but not always, on the upper side of the glass and the black varnish, which is the black backing, is painted on the back of the glass, or at least the black varnish is usually what is a black backing. A true ambrotype is a variation introduced in 1854 where the photographic plate was sealed to a cover glass with Canada balsam, and it is extremely rare, certainly in Britain. So the wet collodion positive was used from the 1850s until about the 1880s and it was presented in the same way as the daguerreotype in cases or passepartout. And this shows you that one with all the components separated out. So you've got the preserver in the middle at the top and that contains underneath the cover glass, then the metal mount, then the photographic plate and then at the back you'll have that piece of paper that you can see here, there's not always a piece of paper there, and then that sits the preserver and its contents as a distinct package in the case. The black varnish on the back is obviously applied by hand as you can see here, so you get these uh, very obvious ripples. Sometimes if dust settled on the surface of the emulsion you'll get these patterns which are called comets as you can see here where you get sort of rip, a ripple in that shape. Usually the black varnish was applied on the opposite side of the glass from the emulsion but occasionally uh, it was applied directly onto the emulsion as you can see in this example and it didn't work so well. You'd get the um, black varnish would penetrate the emulsion. You can see that in the top of this one, which obviously wasn't very visually attractive. And with these particular wet collodion positives, you don't get that slightly three-dimensional quality caused by the emulsion floating above the thickness of a layer of glass above the black varnish at the back. I've included these because I just wanted to show you some examples which illustrate the usage of the uh, wet collodion positive on glass. So these are some portraits which were taken in an area in Hampshire, it's believed, and it just shows you the different sort of usage compared with the daguerreotype. They all depict uh, different sort of characters and occupations within the area. And then here, obviously prior to conservation, we have an image of a wet collodion positive showing a shop front. As I said, they were mostly used for portraits, but not always. We talked earlier about the problem with daguerreotypes and cases being susceptible to insect damage. Well, of course, the same sort of cases were used for wet collodion positives on glass. And so you see the same sort of insect damage and it usually appears as either holes in the corners, as you can see here, or damage on the outside, as you can see here. And if you acquire a collection which includes wet collodion positives or daguerreotypes in cases, it's always worth checking them first to make sure that the infestation isn't active. Usually they're long gone, but it's, it's worth just checking. I wanted to include this one because this really is a beautiful image. 
It was taken by Philip Henry Delamotte, a photographer who was an important figure in the earliest days of photography and who advertised his services in instruction in the wet collodion technique in the first issue of the Journal of Photographic Society. This shows the photograph before conservation, the case is split and the corners on the right hand side are obviously coming apart. The black backing here was a dark piece of textile behind the plate which was sometimes used instead of varnish. This is the photographic plate and that explains why there's no black varnish on the back of it obviously. So here we have the pre and final result after repairing the case and joining it back together again. Here we have an example of a tin type, which is uh, wet collodion positive on tin or iron. The tin or iron has a dark coating. Here you can see that the quality is not the same as the Delamotte image we were just looking at. In fact, people like to collect tin types because of their naive charm. Here we've got another example, which has been put in an album. This one is a little bit of hand colouring, but that's unusual because the tin types were very much cheap and cheerful. As I said before, they were often taken of people on days out to the uh, seaside or visit to the park. Here's an American example, which is obviously more informal. The tin type had a greater variety of uses in the States compared with Britain. It was used, for example, for photographing in the aftermath of the American Civil War. And this is another American example, again, fairly informal. And you can see at the top what happens when things go wrong with a tintype, which is usually that it rusts, and that causes the emulsion to blister and come away. And unfortunately, there's not anything that can be done very satisfactorily about that. And you can see here on the right-hand side of this tin type there's a blister and it's actually cracked and the emulsion has separated away from the metal plate. And here you can see the back of a tin type which is clearly showing the rust damage. So whereas the wet collodion positives on glass are obviously susceptible to breakage, here with the tin type sadly you have uh, rust. So really in this instance it does come down to getting the environment right. I wanted to conclude by showing you some images by a modern day Delamotte, Jack Lowe, to give you some idea of how people are continuing to adapt these processes. Jack Lowe is one example, but there are people adapting these processes in all sorts of ways. He has embarked on a project photographing all the lifeboat stations of the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, and you can see his setup here. This is the converted ambulance he travels in, Nina, which contains his dark room. Jack makes wet collodion negatives and for most images he makes digital prints rather than varnishing the backs of the plates. When I first saw his prints I thought they were stunning. I couldn't have believed that you could really have captured a lot of the qualities of a traditional wet collodion positive in a digital print. Remember, what he is doing is not like making a traditional print where you shine the light through a negative onto a printing paper to give you your image. Nor is he just scanning a negative digitally and flipping it to make it into a positive. He's trying to keep the colour and quality of the negative he has produced as if he has made it a positive by putting a black backing behind it so it still retains the colour and qualities of the emulsion. That is why his images feature here under wet collodion positives. It came as no surprise to me to discover that Jack had been a printer for photographers across the world. The expertise he brings to it should be a lesson to those involved in digitisation projects, just how much skill it takes to capture all the information and do it faithfully. So I'd like to end by showing an image which I think captures the living, breathing world of photography, with the subject, Leafy Dumas, holding a photograph of her which has just been made. I hope you've enjoyed this video on daguerreotypes and wet collodion positives, be they on glass or metal, and thank you for listening.